Good evening and welcome to Close Up. On the show tonight, we will feature the recent Third Pacific Media Summit that was held in New Mayor in New Caledonia. Over the next half an hour, we'll bring you discussions on a range of issues from social media developments in the Pacific to media self-regulation as well as the upcoming Pacific Games. The Third Pacific Islands News Association Summit was held in New Mayor, New Caledonia over a week ago. The venue was SPC's regional headquarters. In the lead-up to the summit itself, a series of industry workshops were held, supported by donor partners. One of those was the Pacific Assistance Media Scheme, or PECMAS-funded social media workshop. This was attended by working journalists as well as communications professionals. And who better to learn from than the Australian Broadcasting Corporation's Head of Digital Operations himself, David Hewer. At the core of social media, it's about story sharing, and there's a very, very long tradition of that in the Pacific. And I guess it's just about trying to let the penny drop with regards to the fact that it's about sharing stories. And there's a long oral culture, long sharing of stories culture in the Pacific, and it's about moving that into a technical space, which is social media on Facebook, on Twitter and on Instagram and a number of other platforms that are coming along. Participants also learning that there is no need to reinvent the wheel, just understanding technologies and the different media platforms. Understanding primarily that the ABC needs to put its content where audiences are. And if audiences are on Facebook and on Twitter, then that's where we need to be as well in order to maintain relevance and to share our great content. Pacific media veterans like Tonga's Kalafi Mwala is one of those now coming to terms with the boundless opportunities offered by social media. I'm enjoying, for example, I'm on Facebook and I'm enjoying it very much. Uh, I have a lot of tips through that to be able to investigate for the traditional print media that we're having. So it's, a, it's an incredibly useful tool. And there's sometimes we even do surveys through, through Facebook, you know, we put it out and say, can you respond? And, and, and what do you think about this whole thing? And, and so there is a conversation that goes on uh, through Facebook. So I'm, I'm a, I guess I'm a Facebook addict. <laughs> Other regional veterans like the ABC's Sean Donnie also compelled to evolve with the changing times. It really is um, a huge challenge um, to, to, to people like myself and, and uh, uh, Kalafi and, and the older journalists who, um, you know, have spent a lifetime working in... I mean, we've been changing all the time. In, in the last 10 years, I've had to do extraordinary changes. I have to turn myself into a cameraman and, and, uh, and an editor uh, as well as being a journalist. And for me, this social media expectation that the ABC has is just this extra work that's involved and they want me to go on Twitter and they, they want, you know, I, I've got a Facebook page, I've been on Facebook for a while, but that's a personal one, but the ABC is very keen for me to tweet and I really find it just that extra bit of work that I don't know if I want to do. Fiji's Fenton Lutumatumbo is with climate change NGO 350.org. Sponsored by PacMass to be here, he walks away with serious lessons. Definitely one of the key lessons that I walked away with uh, was uh, the consistency. Yeah? You have to be super consistent with your updates and with your tweets. Like uh, how, how David, our facilitator, explained it was, it needs to be part of your job, not something extra. It needs to be embedded in the work that you do. So how you program like a radio, radio broadcast or how you program a television uh, broadcast, it needs to be exactly like that. Like, you, you structure your, your strategy in such a way that the audience will depend on it. So that's one thing that I'm, I'm definitely taking away from this, is just being more structured and being, embedding that in, in my everyday work. After this session, Fenton tells me that he has fallen in love all over again with social media. You know how you send out like a press release, right? That can work. But, or you, you send something and you, and you want a bit of coverage on a documentary that you've done. With social media, the platform is there. Like you can upload a video, you can upload a soundbite, you can, you can upload a press release. Also tapping into social media to spread the word on climate change 
is journalism student Shivnil Narayan. It made me realize that climate change is real, it's here and it's now. So it, it doesn't take much, but you just need a simple step to just stand up and make, uh, make yourself heard. And in doing so, yeah, you, you never know, you can empower plenty of other people. Social media actually works best when people who are producing the content understand it as a source of content and understand it as a distribution outlet for their content as well. So it's that entire journey for, for uh, the production process. A highly mobile Pacific population along with the rapid evolution of the media technologies we have now available to us has also influenced how we consume information and news. There's a quote that that a digital analyst has said and mobile is eating the world and I firmly believe that in the sense that whether you're in a highly developed country or whether you're in a developing country, uh, people are engaging with content through mobile services and mobile devices and the phone part of mobile phone is probably going to drop off quite quickly because it's more about just being mobile and people are using their devices less and less for making telephone calls and more and more for connecting via the internet with people. The Pacific media, like their counterparts the world over, is also realising fast that user-generated content can also dictate audience loyalty. Importantly though, for journalistic standards is that you have to verify and you have to have trusted sources because on social media as there is with everywhere else there's plenty of gossip there's plenty of false leads and there's plenty of uh, content that's that's incorrect so journalistic rigor actually has to not only be maintained but it has to actually increase with user generated content but it is a fantastic opportunity to be able to tell stories which you otherwise would not be able to access also attracting much attention at the summit was this Oceania National Olympic Committee sponsored workshop, updating regional media people on the role of sports in the Pacific. It was also a timely opportunity to hear first hand from organizers of next year's Pacific Games in Port Mosby, Papua New Guinea. At the moment we have a staff of around 40 operating in the Games office. We expect to have a staff of about 150 working on the Games at Games time. Around about 2,500 volunteers and about 2,000, 3,000 contractors. So when you put that together with the fact that we've got 22 nations, 28 sports, probably in excess of 3,000 athletes, makes the event perhaps a little bit bigger than a Commonwealth Games. After the break, we hear from the findings of a media self-regulation study and we also hear from MIDA Chairman Ashwin Raj, who also attended the New Mayor Summit. An issue that has generated energetic debate at the Numea Summit was media self-regulation. Laying the platform for this discussion was the preliminary findings of a study commissioned by the UNDP and carried out by USP academic Dr. Ian Weber. The research also prompting some critical questions as well as proposing a regional media self-regulation mechanism. We're really discussing um, aspects of media taking responsibility you know, for their actions. Things like ethics and legal aspects, so they become more professional. It's one of the biggest criticisms by governments um, of media professionals in the Pacific Islands, is their inability to be able to function ethically. Um, and so issues of training are, are very important aspects. Media professionals debated a range of different options, from a voluntary self-regulation mechanism, government-assisted regulation to co-regulation, as well as a fully government-enforced regulating system. We've got the perspectives um, of you know, real working professionals in this particular area, and they were enlightening to say the least. Um, they provided us with an incredible array of new ideas, uh, which will help us to be able to formulate uh, a better plan and a better way to move this forward gradually. The majority of the 200 plus media professionals surveyed across the region gave high importance to public awareness and training and low importance to things like resource, media independence, 
and even transparency. When we're talking about a self-regulatory model, we're really talking about media taking the ownership of this themselves and being able to move this forward. It's very counterproductive, I think, to impose anything upon a particular group. We want to find a, you know, a way for them to be able to uh, take ownership of these particular ideas, take responsibility for their actions, uh, and to have a, an organisation that not only supports them in how to do that, but also protects them uh, when it's required as well. But you know, President Moses Stevens says before any self-regulating mechanism can work, national media associations will need to be strengthened first. What we, we wanted to, do, to talk about uh, strengthening national media associations, developing the structural organization, uh, setting up their vision and mission, and having their code of ethics, having their complaints mechanisms in place, how to deal with those. And because we, we believe in, uh, in that... Uh, uh, the PINA can be as strong only as the national media associations. In Fiji, that's already underway with moves to revive the Fiji Media Association. Despite the differing views on the issue, there is agreement that factionalism has for many years divided even the media fraternity nationally as well as regionally. Our challenge now is how do we get practitioners, people on the ground in the respective countries, get themselves organized, accept to, to come back and rebuild their houses put their houses in order so that we can develop all these self-regulatory mechanisms in place locally and then we look at building it originally. I don't like the word regulation. You know, I think most people will react to it. So I prefer to use professionalization. You know, we want to become more professional and uh, that's, that's where we're, we're pushing. And I think if we are professional in, in what we do, then anybody that's opposed to that professionalism They'll be the one looking like the bad guy, not us, you know. Uh, so I prefer to see the so-called self-regulation as a development through which media, companies and organizations become more professional. I think the, the business part of media plays a lot in those factionalism. Some don't agree uh, and, uh, just because of their business interests, uh, with, the, with the competitions between uh, them and other uh, media organizations and then they leave the professional path and they look at the, the commercial path. Veteran regional journalists like ABC's Sean Donny, who is currently banned from entering Fiji, hopes that Pacific Islanders remain at the forefront of the media profession. My worry is that we probably don't have as many um, Pacific Islanders now heading up these media organizations with the same amount of enthusiasm and the same amount of drive. Now I don't know what the reason for that is, but 20 years ago I was very excited by the Pacific Islanders I met at that very first um, PINA conference and, and how so full of enthusiasm and confidence they were. I, I just hope that PINA manages to hold on to that sort of thing and that there are, you know, young and upcoming journalists uh, in the Pacific who can continue with that, that drive and that enthusiasm. And of course a lot of it was built around trying to defend the media against too much government regulation. And so it was to journalists like Sean Donny that Fiji's Media Industry Development Authority Chairman Ashwin Raj came to Numea with his message. First is that the political landscape in uh, Fiji has shifted dramatically. We are no longer laboring under the PER. There is no emergency decree in place. Uh, the media is free to do its work. We expect to have a robust, free uh, media that reports uh, critically uh, with accuracy, fairness and balance. Uh, reporting, uh, we want to make sure that the media gives uh, equal access to each and every member of the public, uh, that the media is not uh, under any pressure from any entity uh, as it uh, you know, undertakes its work. It was also a unique opportunity for Raj to directly address leading Pacific journalists to report fairly and objectively on developments in Fiji. So we shouldn't presume that this is 1987 or this is 2000 or this is 2006. I mean, we're on the cusp of a national elections. We've got a robust constitution in place and people must move on with the time. On day three of the summit, the media chairman also made it known to donor countries as well as agencies that while technical expertise is always welcome, this should not be mistaken for our need for donor funds. That we are not interested in your money. What we need is for them to enter our protocols. We don't need donors who are going to throw funds, impose conditions on us, 
and, um, and you know that becomes deeply problematic for us. What we need is a set of enlightened donors. Raj also urged regional media professionals to move away from the age-old donor handout mentality prevalent in many parts of the region. The international community cannot be the Praetorian Guard of good governance, human rights and democracy. It's not completely inalienable to who we are and our own conceptions of human rights and democracy. So uh, they should stop being the doorkeepers. Banned journalists like Sean Donny hoping to get a reprieve, it seems may have to wait a little longer. My particular situation is that I'm not allowed back into Fiji at the moment. Hopefully that will change uh, as the elections. Um, come on. There's a lot of parachute journalism going on. They pick a few things from local journalists, then they distort stuff and write a report. I mean, there's very little I can do to change the fact that then they run to some other colleagues um, or go online to say that they still don't feel satisfied that uh, things are not free in, in Fiji. That is their problem. But it's not only the media chairman, Ashwin Raj, who has called on the Pacific media to be a lot more vibrant and forward-looking. Secretary of the Pacific Community, Director General Dr. Colin Tukitonga, has also urged journalists across the Pacific to focus more on fundamental development issues and also tap into the wealth of scientific knowledge and resources at the SPC itself. Because SPC generates a lot of knowledge and information about uh, mining, about agriculture, about fishing, about a whole range of stuff. But we don't always uh, get the information out to the right people who can use it and act on it. The SPC is also keen on establishing a partnership with PINA. I invited the PINA and the members to talk to us and for us to jointly look at a, uh, I know people talk about a memorandum or some such thing, a way of uh, working together so that uh, PINA achieves the uh, objectives of the organization and SBC gets to share the information more broadly. Obviously we have our own ways of communicating with uh, you know, departments in the various countries, but I'm talking more broadly, how can we uh, share the information? We're sitting on a, 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 a gold mine, if you like, of information dating back nearly 60 years and uh, it'll be good to, to have a way of uh, sharing that information. The SPC Director General even urging the Pacific media to be more engaging. And I know there are technical limitations on space and time and number of words and all of that sort of stuff. But for me, I, I think it's uh, really good to be a bit more probing, to be a bit more analytical, to ask the hard questions so that we move the debate on from a, a superficial uh, once over look at the issues but then to look uh, more critically at what's uh, before us. If all of the institutions, whether it's uh, SBC, a regional international organization, or the media, or some local department, it's about serving the people. If we lose sight of that fact, uh, we really need to be asking ourselves what we're doing. Because whatever we're doing, whether it's media or technical work like SBC, Fundamentally, it's about serving the people, helping people to achieve their own personal or their family objectives, as well as helping countries to develop their own, uh, to, to achieve their own development uh, outcomes. But donor-funded projects such as the multi-million dollar Pacific Media Assistance Scheme, or PECMAS, makes no apologies about their contribution to capacity development across the Pacific's media landscape. One of the reasons we brought people here was to, one, was in terms of the social media. Uh, get, that's, that's an area of very strong interest in the region and get them uh, uh, interested, uh, pick up their skills on it. And the second area is in regards to broadcast technology. That's an area often neglected and yet it's, it's the technical IT side that keeps us on air and, and keeps us uh, doing what we do. The Australian government funded PACMAS is also mandated to help national media associations. There's a whole series of activities uh, that we've, we've mapped out for the 14 countries we work in. Obviously there are some geopolitical priority countries. Um, one of this is in regards to national media associations working through uh, at a local level, uh, in country level, uh, some basic skills training but also some specialised areas. There's the issue of um, uh, NCDs, you know, which accounts for a, a lot of deaths in the region, developing uh, media toolkits and that. 
uh, emergency disaster management uh, uh, and the media, that area of, uh, there's a TVET review, review of journalism training in, in the Pacific, that's an area that we will be moving into as well, or we are moving into. So there's a whole uh, range of areas that, um, based on our uh, uh, investigations or discussions with media practitioners and, and governments and others, there was an area of interest, so you know, we, we expand into that region as well. Backpass is also behind moves for broadcasting engineers across the region to form their own professional body under the PIN umbrella. So sharing experience between us engineers is, is very important to all about cars, especially in the Pacific, where we are not, we don't have the money, but we have the knowledge and ideas, and that's the most important thing. This will help us in a way where we can uh, help engineers across the Pacific um, in terms of uh, uh, technology, uh, changing this, uh, transition from uh, uh, analog to a digital platform and also we'll uh, try and get some ideas from other engineers of what can be done to um, help uh, our work in terms of uh, technology. Tutonomics was another popular discussion point at one of the plenary sessions at the PINA Summit. Robert Matau, a veteran business writer with the Allen's Business Magazine, also reminding his Pacific media colleagues that the tuna story might be an old one, but it's one now at the very heart of economic survival for many small island nations. The third Pacific summit ended some 200 kilometers north of Niumea in the nickel producing province of Kone. A four hour one way bus ride to what is arguably the largest nickel mining operation in this part of the world also amongst the fifth largest nickel producers in the world. It was here that the Konyambo Nickel Mines hosted the PINA AGM. The venue also a special one as PINA financial members were informed of the transition of PINA as an association into a company limited by guarantee. This is President and Vanuatu's Moses Stevens and his executive board remaining in office until 2016. Stevens assuring all members that this transition should signal a more open and transparent, accountable regional body to its members and also donor partners. While these changes have been received with mixed reaction, mostly from non-PINA financial members, PINA head Moses Stevens' advice is simple. Rejoin the PINA family and push for change from within. We need to know, that we need to understand, we who are in journalism, whatever your right stays, whatever you write impacts on someone's life. So it, it brings, uh, it stresses the, the responsibility upon one person who writes or who, who writes an item to broadcast on TV or radio. So, or you post it up in a, in a website. Because before you post, up, uh, post anything or you publish anything or broadcast anything, you have to make sure you get your facts right. We still need to speak strongly on uh, truth to power. We still need to become, uh, play our watchdog rule, uh, role. We still need to be very brave in declaring issues that affect our communities, but we do it in a professional way. Uh, the regulation gives you the idea that you're trying to refrain from those uh, duties. That's why I don't like regulation. I, I, I'd rather be that we become professional in the way we do it. The next PINA Summit will be held for the first time in the northern Pacific state of Palau in 2016. The Palauan president, Tommy Raman Gazelle, has already written an official invite to PINA. And that's the show for tonight. Next week, Close Up takes a short break, but instead we will bring you a special one-hour package on the Aeon Tourism Excellence Awards. Until then, good evening.